Okay, so I'm assuming you've been introduced to the Azure Machine Learning Studio environment and you've uh, learned how to import data as a CSV file. So let's now proceed with creating our first experiment. Click this new plus sign down here in the lower left corner and you'll see the option to create a blank experiment, go through a tutorial. We won't go through that right now. You're welcome to do that on your own later, but I don't think it'll be necessary here because I'll walk through the same things. But there's also a whole bunch of other sample experiments that Microsoft has provided for all types of uh, different data mining, data analytics tasks. For now, click on blank, blank experiment and I'm going to change my title up here to import data and summarize. So let's walk you through a couple different ways to import data. First, you should see these options over here on the left. All Azure pills are available here in this menu. Let's go here to saved data sets and you should see my data sets and samples. This is where all the Microsoft experiment examples are stored, the data for those examples that is. And you can use those at any time. You also have that bike buyers data set that you just imported. Now obviously I have a ton of other ones too, don't worry that you don't see those. But let's grab bikebuyers.csv and pull it out here. And we call this a pill right here. This contains some logic that can be performed. If we were writing programming code to do all this, which depending on which class you're taking this, uh, watching this video for, uh, that could very well likely be in your future. But uh, this pill replicates the programming logic required to find the data, pull it in, and make it available to analyze. So you can right-click on any pill, and it gives you some options, some editing options, but then also almost every pill has this option right here to visualize or have other uh, executable functions. Let's visualize here. Let me show you what this does for us. It says we find a thousand rows and 19 columns. Now you've probably seen this data set before if you're taking this as part of my class. So this should look familiar. You see ID, marital status, gender, and you see where I created that numeric version of marital status, one and zero rather than married or single. And here's all those fields. Now look what I can do. I can click on a field. And first I see a histogram right here. Super useful. Uh, this lets me see the shape and spread of the data. So one of the principles you'll either learn in this class or somewhere else is that our predictive models often re rely on normally distributed data. That means it follows the shape of a nice bell curve. You can see this data goes up and then down, meaning we have very few examples at the high end of age and fewer at the lower end, and most of them are in the middle. Now this isn't a perfect bell shape. You can see that it's a little bit skewed right, meaning that we have the bulk of the data on the left side. So it's not perfectly normal, but it looks a little bit normal compared to cars, right, or homeowner, or these fields that are binary where it's a zero or one, or commute distance, that doesn't look very normal. Eight looks pretty close, but when I click on that, I get some nice summary statistics here. Mean, median, uh, min, max, standard deviation. This is very, very useful. And I come down here, and there's a larger version of my histogram. So uh, I'm not going to go through some of these other options right here for this class. I'm going to close this out and show you one other way to get the same data. So uh, if you have a CSV, that's great. It's easy, it's quick, you can upload it. However, you might be working with live data that's found somewhere on a server. And if that's the case, we can reach that data too by using what's called the import data pill. Now notice I typed here in this box and it acts as a search feature. I can close that out, collapse this, and here's all of my it expanded the ones where it thought I might be looking. But here's all my options, and I can go straight to that one. And already I've forgotten it's here on data, input and output. There we go, import data. That's where that pill is found, or I can just search for it. So the import data pill allows me to come over here and enter in information for a SQL Server storage space, or any number of different uh, formats. So here I have Azure Blob Storage, Table, now, I don't have every option. I can't connect like to a MySQL database or an Oracle database yet. If it's not in a SQL Server database, you'll have to have a separate ETL process to copy it from that operational database into an Azure SQL Server or an Azure Blob. Uh, these are like data lakes, if you're familiar with, those, with, that, with that concept. But uh, we're going to use what's called an Azure SQL Server database. And if you're using the, this video for my class, you'll remember that we... Uh, in the book, I've given you some login credentials for a live SQL Server, Azure SQL Server database. 
So we're going to use those to connect as well. Now, if you're just watching this off of YouTube, don't worry about it. Just continue on with the Bike Buyer CSV. I added a link to that in the description. You can use that one. But if you're in my class, let's do this. So the database name, this information is found in your book. Uh, probably in one of the earlier chapters when we first learned SQL. But I'm going to enter in some information for one that I'm going to use. Yours in the book might be the same. It's mkshared.database.windows.net. Database name mkshared. Uh, sorry, no, database name is shared. Username mkshared. And if you need this password, I'm not going to give it here over the video. It's in your book. All right. Now it gives us the option to write our own SQL to select the data that we want. So let me show you what's in this database as a reminder. So I'm going to use Azure Data Studio, which we used earlier in this book, to learn SQL. I'm going to use this to open the same connection and just view what table options are available there. So, mkshare.database.windows.net, um, SQL login. Let's grab the database we're looking for, shared, connect. Okay, so here's a list of all the tables. Here's bb underscore bike buyers. That's the table on the live database that has the same uh, information that you're working through with off of the CSV. So now that I see the name of that table that I want, I'm going to come here and simply say select all from bb underscore whoops bike buyers. Okay, I'm going to uh, click out here so that minimizes a little bit or collapse that. And now what I do is click Run. You'll notice that over here that I was able to view the data immediately. With the import data pill, I can't view the data until I run it. Oh, and I got rid of my, my other data. That's all right. I'll pull it back in. So give this a second. Make the connection. I'll pause it. All right. That's finished now. So uh, here's what we get to do next. This pill's finished running. Notice we have this little circle down here. We had this before. Uh, I'll pull out our bike buyers data again that it lost when I started running. We had it on this file too. Here it's a big number one. When I click off of that and deselect it, it just looks like a little, little dot. What this dot means is that these pills each have one output. Every pill has zero to many inputs and zero to many outputs, depending on what the pill is and what its uh, function is. This output is a way for us to view the summary of the data, and that's what we did before when we right-clicked on here, went to Data, Visualize. So here on Import Data, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to right-click, and here it says Results Data Set, and then Visualize. And I get the same thing that I had before with my Bike Buyers data, and I have all this good information. It's all the same. Um, let's see here. Purchase Bike. America, that's all in there. Income Children, beautiful. Okay. So... I'm going to close this out. What we want to do now is uh, learn another useful pill when we initially get our, first, our data set and we want to explore and understand it. So this um, pill that I want to use is here under statistical functions. It's called summarize data. So I can click and drag it out here. Alternatively, I can use a search box and if I remember the name of my pills, I can start typing and here it pulls up anything with that and I can bring that out here. Now notice summarized data has both a dot up top and below. That means it accepts one input and returns one output. So to connect these or to create a flow of logic, pulling the data into my first step, the next step is to analyze it. So in terms of logical flow, I'm going to take the output of the data set and I click and drag and this becomes an input into this summarized data process. The nice thing is, is notice how when I click and start dragging with my mouse, this input dot turns green, meaning I'm allowed to take the output of this pill and make an input to this pill. Sometimes our pills will have more than two inputs, and an output can only go to one of the two, depending on what it is. The nice thing is, it'll, it'll turn those input dots red if we're not allowed to pull it in. But since it was allowed here, it was green, and we're all good to go. So again, don't click and release click and drag to pull from here into there. Okay, so we've got some more 
logic to run. Let's go ahead and hit run again. Notice I have this run selected option down here. Right now I have no pills selected, and so I don't get that option. But if I clicked on one of these summarized data pills, see how it turns blue and it's selected now? If I hover over run, I get this run selected option. As I hover over, it says that's the pill it's going to run. However, I want to run both of these. Uh, they're going to both do the same thing, so I'm just going to hit run, and it runs everything on the screen. All right. All right, that's finished running, but I just remembered something else I wanted to make sure I showed you. Click on this import data pill. I'm going to minimize this quick help by hitting that down arrow right there. Uh, and then scroll down, pull this down. See this use cache results checkbox? Mine's checked, and I think I did it when it wasn't recording, so yours is probably not checked. Check this box, and what it does is it makes it so that your import data pill won't have to reconnect to the server and re-execute this query every time. Once it pulls the data here into Azure SQL Server, it will stay cached. That's what cached results means, is that it'll keep track of the last time it pulled the data up. So make sure that's checked every time you use an import data pill so that you don't use so much resources of your database in Azure. All right, back to summarize data. Let's right click on either one of these. They should be the same because that data is the same. And visualize. All right, what we have here now are a bunch of statistical calculations about each of our features. Now, we used to call them columns or fields in a database. In data science or in, in uh, data mining, we call columns or fields, we call them features. And that's because we differentiate between different types of columns. Some columns are labels, some are features. A feature is any column, uh, well, in our data set initially, but sometimes we relabel something to the word label if it's a column that we want to predict. Uh, we'll cover that later, but for now, just know that we feature just means a column. So what we had before when we looked at the data uh, summaries was our columns across the top. The summarized data pill is listing our columns down the rows here. You see our ID and marital status and numeric like we had before because we have all these statistical functions across the top here. So count. Well, we know we, there were 1,000 rows before, so count should be 1,000 for all of them, right? Why do we need that? Well, if some of the data was missing. For example, if some of the ages weren't filled in, it could be less than a thousand if there's missing data. So we get unique variable count here. This says how many of the different values for each column were unique. So ID was a primary key in our database, so every value had better be unique, right? Because that's the job of a primary key is to uniquely identify every record. So there's no surprise that's a thousand. Marital status, two values because you're in, in our in this data set at least you're either married or single. Uh, income 16 values great okay I'm going to collapse that and look across the top so we get whoops grab this one we get our min value max value for each field a mean so this is the average uh, for ID we don't care so let's look at something more meaningful down here like income average income is 56,140 mean deviation let's ignore that one for now I want you to come over here we can get the standard deviation so the standard deviation, you might be familiar with that concept, it's 31,000. That means uh, uh, about 65, 66%, I think that number's right, I could be a little off, uh, of our population has 56,000 as the mean, plus or minus 31,000. So the, the income range of 65, 66-ish percent of our data set falls within plus or minus 31,000 of the mean 56,000, anyway. There's some more useful stuff here that I would focus on more. Skewness and kurtosis. These are very useful measures. What they have to do with is how, how normally distributed the data is. Let me show you exactly what I mean here. I'm going to go to Images, Google Images, and I'm going to search for skewness. We'll find some nice diagrams. Perfect. So skewness refers to the histogram um, right here. No, actually, not this one. I'm going to go to our data set. So remember when I showed you the histogram for, what was it, age? Here it is. It's distributed kind of normally. Um, there's an assumption when it comes to prediction, when we get to the next chapter. The assumption is that our data has a normal distribution, and it, has, it means it follows a bell curve. It means that few of our values are small, few of our values are, are large. Most of our values fall somewhere here in the middle. As long as the data is distrib distributed normally, 
some of our prediction functions will work fine. However, skewness says it's not distributed normally. In fact, there's lots of, in this case, a negative skew means that there's lots of higher values and fewer lower values. Positive skew then means the reverse. So if our data is a little bit skewed, it's okay. But if it's a lot skewed, then that's a problem. So it becomes very useful right now in the summarized data pill to examine. Let's go back to examine skewness and kurtosis. So what is the rule I should follow? I just get these numbers. What does it mean? Well, if you remember, it says a positive skew, and this is a very small positive skew, means that the data is got a lot of lower values and fewer high values. Income, for example, should be a positive skew, right? A lot of people have lower incomes to middle. Very few have higher incomes. So if we go over to the income variable, let's find it. Here's income. I wish it would keep the headers at the top. Can I put income right at the bottom and still keep them? No, not quite. So let's remember that it's down here. Income. There we go. Skewness is 0.75. So you can see it's the most positive number of all of our skewness numbers. And that makes sense. Income is the most positively skewed value. However, it's not that bad. Because the rule of thumb that we follow uh, is plus or minus 3. If any skewness value is above 3 or below minus 3, it's too far skewed, either positive or negative. Now, remember I said this data is super clean. You can see that because none of the skewness numbers, they're not even above plus or minus 1, I don't think. Yeah, these are all well within the acceptable ranges for skewness. Kurtosis is similar. Same rule applies, plus or minus 3. None of these values are below negative 3 or above positive 3, so they're safe. But what does kurtosis mean? Come back here and I'll show you. Kurtosis. There we go. Kurtosis doesn't have to do with whether it's moved to one side or the other. Oh, here's a good figure. It has to do with how high or low the slope is. So too high means it's going to be positive. Too low means it's going to be negative. We like it when it's somewhere in the middle, because if it's too low, that's pushing more of the values, a higher percentage of values, out to the, to the ends. Or if it's too high, it's got too small of a percentage of the values out of the ends. So we like our data to, to be bell-shaped and not too high or not too low. So the nice thing is that our, our calculated numbers for skewness and kurtosis both follow the same rule. As long as they're within plus or minus 3, then they're in acceptable ranges. But what if they're not? What if we do then? Well, in a, in a couple more videos, keep going through the book. I'll show you how to perform a mathematical operation to try to fix skewness and kurtosis. But for now, that's the summarized data pill. That's two ways to import data. From here on out, through the rest of the videos, I could be using either one. If you're following along in the book, I'm likely going to be using the import data pill. But if you're watching this off YouTube, don't worry about it. Use the bikebuyers.csv, and it's going to be just the same. All right, that's it for this one.